Well, hello and welcome back, or welcome to those of you tuning in for the first time to Hope Revealed. I'm your host, Matt Crump, and I come to you every Tuesday with episodes of Hope, Help, and Health. You can expect guests that give us great information and insight in the world of business, health, and personal experience, all presented to you as a way to find a Hope Revealed. As a person myself who's been battling stage four cancer, I wanted to bring a platform to you that would specifically bring hope as well as help. And that can be done through our special guests, information I've been able to locate, and information from emails and messages I receive from you, our followers. And you can always email us here at community at godsgotthis.love for questions, comments, or content. On today's episode, we're going to dive deep into life and a hope revealed moment through the life of a very special guest. Welcome to Hope Revealed. Hey, I'm Dr. Ellen, the Grow and Glow Coach. Thank you, Matt, for having me here. It's totally awesome to be your guest today. Thank you. And basically what I do is I empower women to really go from self-loathing to self-love and get unstuck and find the energy, confidence, and clarity so they can make their next chapter their best chapter. You know, midlife is a really powerful time to make some strong transformations. And so I help them align you know, their, their body and their health, careers, relationships, play, leisure, so that they can just really have an amazing next chapter. Oh, that's amazing. So tell me a little bit um, in a second here, but uh, well, first of all, I'd just like to say thanks for, the, for coming to the show. I My appreciate pleasure. being here. Yeah, and you've got some nice flowers back there. You're all matching with all your colors and stuff. It looks great. That's awesome. Thanks. That's cool. So, so tell me a little bit about how, how you really got into something like this. It sounds like you've got an opportunity to really reach people and try to provide some, some help and hope, which is what Hope Revealed is all about. So how did you kind of go from wherever you were at before, whatever that might have been, to where you're at now? What's that kind of look like? Yeah, you know, it's really a story about breaking up with that self-critic, the perfectionist, and finding self-compassion. So what happened is I grew up in a household where, you know, I wanted to be perfect. I wanted to get perfect grades, have a perfect body, have a perfect marriage, perfect kids. And, you know, the self-critic was like on my back, like, you know, work out harder, eat less, get another degree, get another certification, you know, marry this person who's supposed to look like live in this big old house. And you know, I got to that place and I really wasn't very happy. Um, and then what happened is when I was finishing up my PhD, I had gone in for a PhD in psychology. So I'm a registered dietitian. I'm a board certified health and wellness coach. Um, I'm a mindful self-compassion teacher and Reiki master. But I went to get the PhD because I was like, I'm going to be like Jillian Michaels and get everybody skinny and learn how to help them change their <laughs> behavior. You know, and sometimes, you know, God just steps in. And when I was doing my dissertation, I was looking for something that was really going to help women. You know, because women... We're fed all of these kind of BS things. You know, if you read those women's magazines that say like lose 30 pounds in two minutes by eating chocolate, that I'm like <laughs> the counters. That's, you know, we're given these simple solutions and I wanted to find something that would really help women. And I was fortunate enough to discover this whole field of self-compassion, which is basically learning to treat yourself like a good friend. So instead of being critical, being kind to yourself, understanding that everybody suffers, it's part of the human experience, and then being mindful when you're suffering, stopping and turning to yourself. So I started practicing. I took um, an intensive workshop and then I became a mindful self-compassion teacher. And that just really turned things around for me. Um, I could start to really be myself and uh, accept myself and love myself. But then what happened is kind of the world that I had built around myself wasn't working. So I made some changes um, in terms of, you know, leaving a marriage that wasn't working, learning to be easier with my body. And you know, shifting the way I worked with people. So it wasn't about, I was a personal fitness trainer initially when I was starting the PhD. So it wasn't about like, you know, give me 12 more crunches and, you know, go climb those stairs and eat 1600 calories. It was about love yourself first and then everything falls into place. So that's really what I do now is I work certainly with the body and helping women be healthier, but really starting with like that self love piece, which is so hard for everybody. I'd love your, oh, yeah. you know, your take on that as a guy, you know, as women, we're taught like, Put everybody else first, like you know, the spouse, the house, the job, the kids, the dog, the garbage. <laughs> and then we have right. like no energy for us. Um, so I'm trying to help women to be like, you know, you can put yourself first, then everything falls in place, and you have more energy for all that other stuff. There's no doubt. I think everything you said was amazing, except one thing that really sticks out to me is, can I lose 30 pounds by eating chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would love that diet. I'm telling yeah. you right now. 
I mean, I'm yeah. about my lunch here. I'm eating carrots for lunch, right? So I'd rather have yeah. a lunch. <laughs> well, that's amazing, all those things you've been through. And uh, some of it, I just wonder, uh, if I get a little personal for a second, is that there are so many things that you were doing, uh, lots of different classes, courses you're taking, and such that you were just talking about. You did say that uh, by the time you get to that mindset time, it really made a, lot, a big difference for you. Um, were you were you at that time adding all those things into your life because you were really not happy with it? You were trying to just keep yourself busy and occupied with things and kept doing stuff to fill in the blanks. Is that just, is that kind of what was going on too? Great point, Matt. Yes. Functional workaholic, but it's true. I work with a lot of women who are workaholics and instead of listening to their hearts and their emotions and saying, ah, you know, I'm not so healthy. I need to address that. This relationship isn't working. I need to address that. My career, I'm not feeling it. Like a career that once felt great when I was 20 or 30, I'm not feeling it. I want to do something new. But instead of dealing with the emotions that come up, you know, they might, they get into addictive behavior. So a lot of it is for me, it was workaholism. It was over exercising, trying to be perfect, thinking, well, you know, if I get that PhD, you know, if I get the nicer house, then I'll feel good about myself. So I think yeah. you're absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head. For me, it was a lot of working on myself, but not the way that, you know, God wants me to be here, to be right. a light and help people to connect with who they are and what their gifts are. It was much more about this idea of what I'd been brought up to think was success. And then I, if I reached that, then, you know, my parents would be proud of me. I'd be a success. And I was just really unhappy. But you're right. The workaholism was a way that myself and a lot of women, I'm sure men too, they work so they don't have to deal with the emptiness that's in their heart. There's no doubt. I mean, I've experienced that myself. Uh, I know lots of people as being a pastor for over 30 years. I've talked to a lot of people and uh, that comes quite often in the territory with us human beings. Uh, we're not that much different. So what, what are some of the things for you that were that clicking point that uh, revealed some of that to you to kind of um, slow down, not necessarily, you know, divorce and all those other things, but I'm talking about right. for you personally, right? I mean, what are, what were some of those key indicators for you to like, oh man, I'm so busy. I'm too busy kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I think that as my kids were getting older, that was like a wake up call to slow down and spend time with them. But I mean, I had a couple of incidents where the self-compassion really stepped in when I was taking the mindful self-compassion course. I was at Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York. And, you know, I've always been a jock, this idea of, you know, pushing my body, pushing my career. And I developed a blister on my foot. And usually, you know, I'd be the jock, like suck it up, you know, push through, no pain, no gain. And I actually stopped at the wellness center they had and got a Band-Aid. Now, it sounds like a little thing, but a moment of self-compassion will change your day. And a string of those moments will change your life. So that was like a really, like an aha moment. Like, oh, I don't have to push all the time. And, you know, I think too, I was really stressed out. My thyroid started to go south. Um, I was exhausted all the time. So my body was feeling, even though, you know, I, I would, was working out four to six hours a day with all my clients, you know, some of those, you know, those women who are up group exercise, like, come on, they're with the 20 pound, pound dumbbells. Yeah. And I was just exhausted. I was depressed. Um, I had depression. I was taking antidepressants. And so the self-compassion started to shift things because the whole point of self-compassion is to treat yourself like a good friend, to notice when you're stressed and suffering. And if you're listening out there and you're saying, oh, this, what does the self-compassion thing mean? Think about when something goes wrong, the next time something happens to you, say, hey, if this happened to a good friend of mine, what would I do? Like, for example, if you get, let's say you get in a car accident and usually we're like, oh my God, exchange, you know, insurance companies get on the phone, call my company, call the collision center. But with some compassion, you're like, oh my God, I'm upset. You know, I just got in a car accident. You put your hand on your heart. So a lot of that, both formal practices of meditating and turning to myself, checking with my emotions. And so it was like a gradual process where I slowly started to see the way that I was treating myself wasn't working. And I really started to swap that voice of the self-critic, which was trying to keep me perfect and in line for that voice of self-compassion, which says, you know what? We're all bozos on the bus. We're not perfect. I mean, that's God. You know, we're perfect in God's eyes and we're perfectly imperfect, but those cracks are what make us human. And so being able to appreciate the dark and the light, you know, appreciate that I'm not perfect and turn towards myself. So it was a gradual process but that first aha moment was great and then 
last last April of 2018, my retina detached three times. So oh I went my gosh, blind. Three times? How that happened? Three times. Yeah. Well, they kept doing procedures. They did two in-office procedures, and it wouldn't work. My left eye doesn't work very well at all. So this is my right eye. I just had cataracts, and so. I really needed that self-compassion practice because not only was this fear that I was going to go blind, which was terrifying, but also I had to lie face down on a massage table for 19 to 20 hours a day. You have to do this thing called positioning where you have to what? position. So there's this bubble they put in your eye and so to, to let it heal because it covers the scar. And so yeah. the doctor tells you to put your body in a certain position. You must stay there or your eye will not heal and you will go blind. So that was a big thing where I realized all of these, you know, I had a couple of years to practice the self-compassion and had I not known how to be there for myself through what was a really trying time, scary and also physically difficult. I'm not, a, you know, I've got all this fire energy. I don't like to sit still. Um, I made it through and I've got, thank God I've got my sight back, but a lot of strings of things. And then also that, you know, got me to the point where I could realize that the relationship, my marriage was really toxic and I had the, um, the energy and the courage to leave um, and rebuild my life. Uh, so it's a hard, hard when you're realizing, you know, I'm not happy with my life and what do I do to change? Because our brains don't like uncertainty and change. And so even if you're miserable, we'd rather stay in the cage and stay miserable than jump outside and say, I'm going to create something new. Yeah, no doubt. So, okay, there's a lot of things that uh, come to my mind. I'll just take a little bit at a time because we don't have like 17 hours to do the show, but <laughs> So for some folks that would, would uh, I think for guys specifically, but I, I know many women that are the same way, uh, there's this one P word that kind of gets in the way of, of taking some of these different outlooks in your life, which is called pride, uh, when mm -hmm. you don't want to identify, or don't identify, you know they are there, but you would choose to ignore them because of pride, right? So you said, uh, like you had a car accident, you'd put your hand on your heart kind of thing, right? Well, not too many guys are going to go around going, oh, oh, I don't feel so good right now. I want to take care of myself, right? All right, so that's just not regular. Uh, but it is, it is good to, to have some of that reflection and self-care, right? So, so what does that kind of look like without being, uh, you know, like a fruitcake kind of feeling like for a guy like, I don't want to do that, right? But, you know, how can you, how can you do something like that uh, to really overcome, especially for some of the folks that would watch this that, that may have, a, I'm not saying anybody watches this show does, but maybe there's other people that might be a little bit prideful in their lives. Um, right. How do you overcome that into what you're talking about right now? What was that? How, do you, how would you uh, say that would be a place of overcoming? Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, you know, the pride thing is really like your ego saying that this is the way I'm supposed to look. A um, couple of initial steps um, besides just sort of letting go of that so you can be more of your true self. Um, one thing I have all my clients do, and this would work for the guys, is to just make a list of how you'd like to care for yourself. So think about my body. What would I like to do for my body? You know, do I need to sleep more, eat better, exercise? What do I need to do for my mind? You know, is, you know should I read, maybe get some therapy, um, take a walk out of nature? What would I do for my emotions? How do I sort of turn myself? Maybe I need to see a funny movie or, again, get some counseling or talk to a pastor uh, you know, emotions, what are you doing for your spirit and what are you doing for relationships? So think about all the ways I'd like to take care of myself. And then the point of the self-compassion piece is when you start noticing you're feeling stressed out. So maybe you're not having trouble at work or having trouble in a relationship, um, having trouble with your body of just saying, okay, how do I take care of myself right now? What can I do? So that's that mindfulness piece, noticing when you're stressed out and instead of being like, okay, I'm going to go get another cup of coffee. I'm going to work for another six hours and figure this out. Just say, you know what? I'm going to take five minutes and just go get some air or I'm just going to take 30 seconds and breathe. So starting to notice what are the practices, the things that are going to help me feel better. Um, so that would be my first thing. The second thing I would say is that when you start to notice that you're stressed out, I mean, emotions are felt experiences in the body. So when you're feeling stressed out, usually like your shoulders come up here, or you get a headache, your throat tightens, usually something in our trunk, your heart tightens up or your gut may go south and you might start having, you know, feeling your stomach rumbling. Um, so when you notice that, ask yourself, what emotion am I feeling right now? So what happens is, let's say you're feeling a frustration or sadness or fear. When you can stop and you, you, know, you name it, you tame it. When you can name that emotion, instead of just going like, okay, I'm just going to plow forward and ignore it. When you name it, you take it from the primitive part of your brain, particularly something like fear, which is like the amygdala, which is a, the primitive reptilian part of your brain. You bring it into the frontal cortex and like, okay, 
I'm feeling sad right now. Like I found out today that my dog is dying. It's really sad, right? Instead of like, I'm just going to go through my day. I'm like, I got to take it easy with myself today because I love sizzle and I'm upset about this. So, you know, you realize, oh gosh, this is sadness and I'm feeling sadness in my heart. So that's the first piece is to name it, you tame it. And then um, feel it, you heal it. So emotions are felt experiences in the body. So if you can, for the guys out there, women too, feel it in my body. What does my body feel like right now? We sort of live from the neck up a lot, but you, and that's, I think, why sometimes people, you know, have, have um, discomfort in their body or disease in their body. They're dis-ease, they're not imbalanced. So feel it, you heal it. Allow emotions to come and go. What we do in our society is we push them away, or as we said earlier, we engage in addictive behavior. So we might, you know, eat too much, grab that spoon, have a threesome with Ben and Jerry's, right? Um, work, thinking, oh yeah, if I get that win in work, that takes my mind off this problem. Or, um, you know, we might gamble or engage in, you know, Netflix binging, whatever it is. So the point is to feel your emotions, to name them, tame them, feel them, heal them, and just let them come and go instead of pushing them away. And that's really what you need to do to resolve and, let, and move forward and grow. So hopefully, does that make sense from a, from a male perspective? Yeah, it totally makes sense, especially the Ben and Jerry's part. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'd probably take half a gallon myself, but uh-huh. uh, yeah, that's all right. You just have to figure you're going to go outside and work real hard the next day and work it off, you know? <sighs> so well, what no, happens that's, is- that's good. Yeah, if you do that, if you have the threesome with Ben and Jerry's, you're still stuck with the problem. So you're still stuck with this difficult emotion. But on top of it, now you've got kind of this guilt, these feelings, oh, gosh, I failed here. So if you can kind of nip it in the bud, um, it really will help you to to feel better. Um, And you grow a lot. It takes time, though. I mean, I've been at this for a while, and it takes. it's a constant process of learning to love yourself on a deeper level. Yeah, you know, uh, you hit another keyword there, failure. And uh, failure is a big deal for a lot of people. And it's not that pride gets in the way. It's um, uh, complacency and, and loss uh, can create some new habits in people's lives that causes them to do things differently that subconsciously now they're not even noticing that they do anymore. It's an unconscious competency, right? Or, or incompetency. Right. Um, yeah, that's a big deal. Um, What would be some ways, let's say you are the friend, not the person, but you're the friend. What, what would you say are some ideas or some pointers that you could use, uh, especially with a guy because then pride pops back up. But if they're operating in failure, they're operating in places where, uh, anybody, guys or gals, uh, operating places where things are not, uh, operating the way they should. It's pretty obvious. What would be some ways of nudging them in the right direction of, of sharing a couple of things because uh, some folks you know they can just sit down and have a heart to heart no problem and that's and you can go to town and, and have all kinds of great conversations but then there's some folks that are closed close fisted that are some uh, strong introverts and uh, they're not going to share those things with you but you can drop some nuggets that uh, because a strong introvert is going to go home and think about it um, right. what would be some of those things that, that you would suggest saying, here's a couple of, uh, of nuggets to drop or some things to think of or, or attitudes or actions or whatever? Sure. Um, so, you know, the first thing is, you know, change your perspective on failure. I mean, like thinking about little kids, like if you're, you've got, you know, a 13 month old, they're learning to walk when they fall down, do you say, okay, sorry, buddy, stay seated. <laughs> right. Of course not. You pick them up and you go, come on, let's go. Um, so failure is just a stepping stone on the road to success. We all fail. We all make mistakes. It's all part of the human condition to align them. Maybe sharing a story of failure yourself. Like I've had so many failures, you know, I've gotten the Oprah call that fell through. I've had so many ups and downs in my business. I've been an entrepreneur forever. Failure is part of life. That's that common humanity piece of self-compassion. And when you realize and you share, you know, so I would maybe share like, you know, Bill, you know, I know what that feels like. Let me tell you, three years ago, I was in a situation with my marriage and I thought, you know, we were going to split up and everything was on the rocks and I failed. I failed as a husband, as a spouse. And so I, you know, had a heart to heart. So sharing your own failures, showing some vulnerability, vulnerability is this beautiful way to connect with others. And it allows people to, to open up. Like your introvert, you're saying, if you share your vulnerability and your mistakes and your failures, well, that make, might give them some space to share as well. So if you're listening, failure is just part of the trip. Nobody out there, you know, is perfect. We all fail. We all make mistakes. 
that is the first thing. And that really is, you know, how we learn. I think a big piece of it too is, is also forgiveness. You know, again, I've made lots of mistakes, really stupid business decisions and I've learned from them and I'm not going to repeat those mistakes. So forgive yourself. Beating yourself up really shuts you down that, that inner critic. All it does is you generate cortisol as if someone else was criticizing you, except you are both the victim and the bully at the same time. Right. So, you know, giving them some space to, you know, forgive yourself. Like that might take some time, but it's okay. We all fail. We all make mistakes helping them learn to forgive themselves and then maybe help them also too. I, this is something I love to do with, I do with all my clients, make a list of your strengths. What's great about you? Like I have things that I'm awesome at and I have things that I suck at, you know? And yeah, so what I'm yeah. learning to do is like, okay, like for example, I'm in a great new relationship and I'm kind of selfish. It's part of my makeup. And so I have to go out of my way. Like last night, I let him have the last chicken wing, you know, and it's like, <laughs> are you going to eat that last one? Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> but understanding, you know, your weaknesses and not so much compensating for your weaknesses, but being okay with that. And then looking at like helping your friends see what are you, what are you awesome at? Um, and you know, and just saying, you know, I'm here for you. How can I help you? Or the door's always open. So there's a lot of things. I think the more vulnerable we can be, the more we put a hand out, the more we show, you know, our own vulnerability, more we can connect with people and realize, you know, we're all, we're all leading each other home, right? We're all here to love and support each other on a deep level. Yeah, no, that's so good. Well, and then of course that really moves in really what the show's all about. And what we've been talking about is, is revealing a hope. And, and in these uh, instances of these um, scenarios we've been talking about, we've had an opportunity to reveal little nuggets of hope, right? Um, so let's just kind of bring it into a, as personal level as we can get uh, into your life. Uh, there's, I'm sure, um, some moments in your life, if you're human, uh, which I think you are, last I checked, hey, yeah, you are. <laughs> so, you know, is there a spot in your life where, where I guess, you know, it just, it really just hit the fan and things were just really, really bad. By the way, that statement's kind of nasty when, when the stuff hits the fan. You ever think yeah. about that? Like, that would be gross. Yeah. I mean, just, I don't know, <laughs> whoever came up with that in the first place, it must, <laughs> did it really happen? Was that this? okay? Anyway, sorry. I just go there sometimes. That's okay. Right, so when uh, when things got really bad, <laughs> right? When things got tough, and and there was this moment in your life where maybe some kind of failure or some kind of uh, of a, of a uh, instance in your life where where it was really a negative effect in your life, um, but then something happened. It was a a word or a circumstance or a situation or something occurred in your life that made you feel like, wow, there, there really is hope. And it really pointed you into another direction and, and another area of your life. You know, is there something that like that you had in your life you could share with us? Yeah, I have to think for a minute, but I mean, I think that, um, you know, just going back, maybe it's because my divorce and marriage is so fresh and it was 25 years and it, you know, in a lot of ways it felt like a failure. You know, here are these, you know, you, you get married and you think it's forever and you have a bunch of kids together and you have this beautiful house and this life that looks great on the outside, but inside it's like a rotten apple. Yeah. Um, and again, this piece of um, just the forgiveness piece, the piece, and also surrounding myself with, with a new tribe. So, I mean, that was a big piece of when I went through that, of developing new friends, people who really love and support me and coming out the other side, realizing um, who, are, who am I really? How do I show up in that way in the world and really connect with people? And I guess other things too, just, just having business failures, you know? And every single business failure, like when I had that Oprah call, which was about four or five years ago, honestly, Matt, I wasn't ready. Um, I yeah. wasn't at the place soulfully. Like I wasn't ready hindsight feelings? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, so what did, you feel, it, what did you feel like when the call came? Well, when the call came, it was like a couple of days before Christmas. I remember I was, um, I was testing Cutco knives with my daughter's friends, right? I get this call. <laughs> we some of those too. Holy smoke. <laughs> I get this call, you know, and I hear this, this woman, you know, Ashley, she's a, she is a, um, the executive editor. And I thought she said L magazine. I didn't hear O. And I was like, I'm oh, not a big deal. Cause L's not that big a deal. I've, I've done a lot of media. I've been in front of millions of people live on TV. I've been in lots of magazines and things. So I was like, Oh, no big deal. And like the next day I get the email, like it's no, it's Oh, the Oprah magazine. I was like, Oh my God, I got the O call. My life is dead. <laughs> you know, cause you know that feeling, right? When you're an author or you're a coach or a speaker and you get the Oprah call and you're like, yes, that's the moment I've been waiting for. 
Um, and then I had just come back from the self-compassion teacher training and I went to the store. It was supposed to be in the April magazine and I'm leafing through and I'm leafing through. I had six interviews with this woman and I was like, oh yeah, it's going to be in and here's the section. Well, like you literally, you did the, you did all the review, the oh, interview yeah. and everything. You had the story oh. done. Yep. Yep. Everything was set. You know, oh was my like, gosh. And then I opened up the magazine and it wasn't there. It wasn't there. And I was devastated. <laughs> what page? <laughs> exactly. I looked through it like six times. I'm in the grocery <sighs> store. I'm shaking and it's not there. And oh. I called the editor and she's like, rest assured, we'll get you in another issue. And of course that, that never happened. She ended up leaving there and that, that door closed. But honestly, I was, I was at this place where I was, you know, being, I was Dr. A at that point and I was going to like, you know, big, this big famous, it was all ego. It was so wrong. And the, you know, fast forward five years later, I'm redoing my brand right now. I'm on point. I'm doing real healing work and I'm doing it for the right reasons, not because I want to be famous, um, but because I really want to reach as many people as possible with this message of let's go from self-loathing to self-love. We think that we need to loathe ourselves to motivate ourselves to accomplish, but that is just, the you know, you gotta love yourself. You just have to. And then when you love yourself, that's what you reflect in the world and people, yeah. you know, gravitate like with you, you're so awesome. You're just like tagging everybody, sending out all this, these positive vibes, you know, and the universe is like sending you and connecting you with people. Um, and so I'm at a place, you know, whether I get the Oprah call or not, I don't really care. I guess it would be nice. Um, yeah, Oprah, right. if you're listening, right? Yeah, but, no um, doubt. But I'm, I'm totally comfortable with myself. You know, I go to bed every single night and say, you know what? Today was an awesome day. It's a good day to die. Like if this is my last day, I could just go saying, you know what? Today was an awesome day. And that's the way I live my life. Whereas in my old life, every day was misery. Um, and yeah. so I don't worry. So I don't worry about what exactly happens. Um, I'm really focusing on every day. What am I doing to help more people and move myself forward and connect my you know, let go of who I'm supposed to be and embrace who I truly am and shining that light out there so other women can resonate with it and say, yeah, yeah. you know, I got half my life. I got a big 25 years left in my life and I can make some significant changes, make a difference in the world, feel good about myself, be happy and joyful. So that was like, I think one of the, the biggest failures I've had. I've had a lot of successes too, but that was a devastating failure that took a while to recover. Um, yeah, it, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask a couple questions about that. Uh, one, there's a, there's a, a guy in the Bible. He, uh, wrote actually most of the new Testament. His name was Paul. And one of the things that Paul said was I died daily. And, uh, that could be a, a tough scripture for some folks to understand what that means. Like, I mean, how do you just like die every day? Right. But of course what he meant was he was dying uh, to himself, you know, like I'm going to put myself on the shelf and I'm, there's something bigger, uh, which obviously we know what that is. However, in your case, uh, where you were talking about that moment where, you know, the magazine's not there. They said, we're going to have you in another, epi another, uh, uh, what's it called? Another magazine, issue. another issue. Yeah. I'm thinking episode with podcast, another, another issue. And the other issue doesn't come. The girl ends up leaving and you're thinking, crap, this is just never going to happen. Right. So, I mean, you had the place between, uh, the April issue when it didn't show up to whenever you realize it's just not going to happen. Uh, so there was some emotions there. But then the emotions are really going to change when you had to accept the fact that this is not going to happen. All right. So when you knew this is not going to happen, not fast forward to, you know, the awesome guy you are today. Right. But that, that moment, you, that moment, what was going on then for you, key identifier. And then, then what was it that shifted? Was it a week, a day? A month did you go through you know what what did that look like because that's a big deal when you think that the moment you have your aha moment that's happening here and people are gonna finally you're on the map and it's not gonna happen and something's gonna right. Happen, right? what 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 was that yeah um I think that I was devastated for quite a while and my ex-husband and I had put a lot of money into her website and wrapped this whole thing up and so then there there was just we, we kept it was like um you know, banging your head against the wall. The brand was just not working and just not working. And then, you know, what usually happens is that you move on and another door opens up. And so I started working on my coaching, working on myself and attracting women at midlife and working on them, not just with sort of the body, body image, diet, weight loss, in that arena, but really broadening what I'm doing, um, starting to really love my work. And I think for me, and this is a, this is a constant, um, 
issue. And I think you picked up on it when you were like, you know, are you a workaholic? But just realizing that, you know, work and career is just one area, arena of my life. I have lots of other arenas. I have relationships. You know, I have hobbies that I love. Um, I have, you know, my health. I have all kinds of abundance and joy and love in my life and realizing, you know, the career is just one part of my life. It's an important part that I do focus a lot of attention on, but you know, everything else is working really good. So I think, you know, if you get into that space of gratitude, which is so powerful, people are listening and you're feeling upset, you can be grateful for what you have and appreciate things. Then that stuff multiplies and amplifies. And if you can also just understand that everything truly is working for your highest good. Um, I don't regret that that had happened because I think that I would have been in this ego headspace and not done the kind of soul searching and change. I'm really happy with the, the woman that I am today. Was that so the revelation you got then, Ellen? Was that the revelation that you got at that moment when you knew this isn't going to work? Um, did you know, I don't think necessarily the ego thing probably hit you that day, but did you, did you know within a period of time that that's what you were wrestling with or did somebody bring it to your attention? Or was this something you internalized that you realized I got an issue with this and then you started dealing with that and moving forward into the area of gratitude and all those Well, What was that right there? So I'm trying yeah, to- Yeah, I think more of it was, Matt, a slow process. I didn't have this like lights went off, you know, rainbows and unicorns or, you know, God yeah. shows up and says, yeah, I've got better plans for you, don't worry about it. Um, it was just a slow process of really coming to terms with the fact that a lot of the things that I had well, I guess a piece of it too was that my clients were doing awesome and having these amazing lives and traveling oh, like and falling in love. And I'm thinking, sometimes, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, what is this mirror? Like, what is wrong with me that my clients are super stoked? Like, I have a client now. She's like moving to Australia, found the love of her life. I have another client who's building this amazing speaking business, another client who is like doing a, a teaching and um, writing business. I have clients who are just doing the grooviest, coolest things. And I'm thinking, why is my, I mean, I'm supposed to empower women in midlife and I felt so disempowered. So I think that, um, it wasn't a, a big revelation. It was just this slow coming to a realization that my life was working. And also I think a big piece for me too, that shifted things is frankly, I got out of the spiritual closet. Um, I have always been, um, spiritual, um, and, I sort of hid that all behind sort of these degrees as academics. Like, you know, I've got a PhD and I've got more degrees than a thermometer. Yeah. Um, and I would be like, but honestly, I love spirituality. I love to pray and heal people or help them heal themselves. And so I think when I, you know, I started teaching Reiki and literally praying with clients and sort of moving my business into a more spiritual dimension and being comfortable with that, um, because I don't come from a family where that's, you know, what people do. Um, and I think that's really shifted things when I started to really open my heart up more and connect with people on that sort of spiritual heart level. Um, but it wasn't like a big one big revelation that shifted things. It was sort of more of a slow, gradual process of, again, letting go of who do you think you're supposed to be and embracing who you truly are. And then oh, that's fantastic. your work in the world to help other people do the same. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so let's say that you, that person, is listening right now and they realize now they, they, they got the call you know, it's been a couple of months now and uh, living in that moment um, where you were at and uh, and now they have a chance on this show this could be that moment that they hear something that is going to bring hope in their life and help them to shift gears so uh, that that you then who may be what listening now what right. would you tell you back then now that you'd want to know yeah, what I want to know. I guess two things. I would say first thing is get some help. Like you have an awesome program coming up, which I am totally stoked for you. I think your flip program is going to be fabulous for people. Oh, I'm here you. to help if you resonate with that. Find someone that you resonate with. You don't have to go it alone. I mean, the whole point of coaching is that it can get you to, from here to here way fast. Well, of course, here to here is going to be like this, but a really trained, compassionate coach that you resonate with is going to help you to hold up both a mirror and a flashlight. So you have a mirror. So that's all about who am I? Like that whole, you know, what are my blind spots? Who am I? What do I love to do? What am I curious about doing some real, um, you know, psychological tools to help you figure out who I am, what I like, what I'm good at, what are my strengths? And then that flashlight. Okay. So where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in three years, a year, six months from now? So that it's kind of like my, my Bo says, um, you know, it's like the story of 
being in the tiger pit, right? And you're in the tiger pit and you don't know how am I getting out of the tiger pit? You know, you're walking along and there's this pit to catch tigers and you fall in and like somebody jumps in the pit with you and they're like, Hey, I know how to get out of the tiger pit. You know, here's my hand. I'll pull you out of the tiger pit. So, um, get some help. You figure out who am I? Like, what did you love to do when you were a kid? What sets your heart upon it? Whether you keep your job and just like do a side hustle or volunteer, figure out where do I shine? Where do I come alive? Where am I in, in that genius zone where like time doesn't even exist? Um, yeah. That's where you're supposed to be. What makes you come alive? But yeah, I would say get some help, get to know who you are, you know, turn to a spiritual practice, whether, you know, whatever that is. I know you have your, you know, your specific, um, focus of what you do, but whatever that is, surround yourself, you don't necessarily have to get coaching, you surround yourself with a spiritual community or read some spiritual books or just ask God for guidance and, you know, and stuff will drop from the sky. It really will. Trust me. I've seen it in my own life. It doesn't happen a lot that I get like a sign, but I've had times in my life where it's like, all right, you are on track. Like I literally, I don't hear angels or anything like that, but I see rainbows. I really do. Like I see rainbows you know, as a sign every once in a while, you know, the Lord's like, here you go, just rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that I, I know what that means. Or I'll see like feathers or I'll see angel numbers like one, one, one. And it's sort of like to me that, you know, God's here, that there is a spirit there. So again, um, get some help, um, figure out who you are and what you love to do and, you know, what your gifts are. Even if you're not quite sure, just move in that, you got to move in some direction um, and then, you know, ask for some, some divine intervention and some guidance and know that everything truly is working for your highest good. I mean, I, I like to say to people is the universe is 3.7 billion years old. All right, folks, so we're here like that. That would be a final thing. Make the most of your life. Get off your friggin' fear potty. The thing that's keeping you stuck is your fear. I know it was for me. Oh, <laughs> good idea. <laughs> You gotta get off the fear potty. You know, do what's scary. There's that fear thing that's keeping you back. I've seen it with my clients all the time. They don't want to, you know, face their eating and their weight because if they were to lose a hundred pounds, how would they have to show up in the world? So the weight becomes like this barrier. Plus it's hard if you failed a lot of weight loss. I have nothing but compassion. I've worked with thousands of people around helping them get in healthier bodies, but the health can kind of keep you stuck and people want to stay stuck. So whether it's your body and you're keeping the weight on because you're scared to move forward and change, whether it's a career because you have that steady paycheck and you're really scared, like, oh my God, I'm going to lose my pension and my steady paycheck, whether it's a relationship because well, maybe I'll never find someone to love me. Or what would the kids say? Or what would my parents say? What it would be like to have that, you know, big D on my, on my shirt. And how am I going to meet somebody in the world of match.com? Um, whatever it is, uh, whether, you know, you want to travel, you want to do something fun, but I'm scared of like going to a foreign country, not knowing the language, whatever it is that your heart really wants to do. If fear is holding you back, figure out this is what I want to do. And then figure out what's my next steps. So you got your point Z. Like I want to learn French, go to Paris. Um, and so my point, you know, my point B is like, okay, I buy some French tapes or I'm thinking about like, I want to do another career. So maybe I visit a career counselor or I get some coaching help or I, you know, start looking at a side hustle, but do something. Don't stay stuck because you know what, this moment, I always tell people when you look back at this moment and this moment, if you're listening to this, maybe this is your wake up call, right? Yeah. When you look back at this moment, when you're 85 years old, what do you want your life to have stood for? Yeah. Legacy. Absolutely. That's another big word. Of course, that's uh, the yeah. L and the flip. So I appreciate that yeah. little uh, flip yeah. bit there. But and I, listen, your program's awesome. I'm sure I can feel it, that it's just going to be really, really on fire. And, Man, so, and that's the, the money program. Don't worry about the money. You can always make money. The universe is an abundant place. The universe is expanding. We have, we stay in this little box and like, oh my God, I don't, I don't, I can't afford it. Can you afford to stay where you are? Right. That's one of the things I ask people is like, all right, just look at your life right now. Is it three years from now? It's the same. Are you good with that? Five years, 10 years. I mean, come on. In the grand scheme of things, is a few bucks going to stop you from having that? Come on. So no doubt, but those are some fantastic tips that you, uh, that you just shared with us and a great opportunity for somebody who may be in that position now has been experiencing uh, some, some failures um, when you are beating your head against the wall, we both know what that feels like. Um, when you feel as if there is no hope, uh, the crazy thing is as much as you feel that's so true, it's not, there is, and you will get through it. There is an opportunity on the other side of what you're facing right now. Guarantee that there is. 
might not feel like it, but here's two people here. One, one, oh, the other way, I got to point the cameras backwards. Over there, over there. <laughs> Alan and myself are, are great people that can tell you what we've been through. And sometimes you think, yeah, whatever, I don't care, that's you, it's not me. No, it's all of us. <clears throat> I, I can have anybody on this program, she can have anybody on hers, and we're all going to be able to sing some of the same stories, different circumstances. But nothing's going to stop you except you. <laughs> so you have to Absolutely. stop doing that, right? Get off the fear potty. She just talked about a minute ago. Yeah, but I'm scared to get off the fear potty because you're on the fear potty. Get off the fear potty. Right? <laughs> you just got to move on. And that's a fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, word of advice there. I appreciate that. So how can folks, if they want to get a hold of you, because you, you obviously offer some great programs for folks, how do they get a hold of you to find out how they can do that? How can they reach you? Well, thank you for, uh, for asking. Um, just go to drellenalbertson.com. Just, you can Google Dr. Ellen Albertson. You could go to just drellenalbertson.com by the, the right big contact box. Hit the contact box. Say, hey, Hey, Ellen, I listened to your, your interview with Matt. It really resonated with me. We'll find a time to sit down. We can do a Zoom call or we can do a phone call. I have clients as far away in Australia. And, you know, we'll have a real coaching session. I'll get to know you. You get to know me. No obligation. If you want to go on your way, that's totally cool. I'm here to help people. If you have a great experience and you're like, you know what? I'm ready to step up and change my life. Well, we can talk about what working together looks like, but you know, go ahead and contact me, Dr. Ellen Albertson.com. I know you do a lot of LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I've got a great um, mastermind group called uh, Dr. Ellen's mastermind. I do challenges. My next one is love yourself to help, which is starting in a couple of weeks. Um, so I'm always doing great things. In Dr. Ellen's mastermind. I give free Reiki on Wednesday. So you can Google me. I'm everywhere. Um, and awesome. I would love to help you. No, I, I guarantee you she will. And uh, like she said, she's all over the place. Maybe not omnipresent, but she's definitely here to serve, right? So that's Indeed. fantastic. I appreciate all the place you're at. And we'll put those links here in the, in, the pro, in the podcast, and you'll be able to click on those here, whether you're visiting us here on YouTube today. It might be at LinkedIn. It might be at uh, podbean.com. might be at iTunes. We're all over the place, too. So uh, thanks so much again for uh, being here with us today, Ellen. It was really fantastic to have so many great things you have. I mean, you've got, like you said, more degrees than a thermometer. And we went through several of them that most people may not even realize while we've been on this program. And I really appreciate that you could do that and share so many great things, especially those beautiful little red and white flowers right behind you. They look oh, so, you. so pretty, so alive. I like that, yeah. Daisies. And I have to thank you for what you do because I don't know if everybody knows your story, but you are such an inspiration. I have to say this is one of the most fun interviews I've done in a while. I do a lot of interviews. Oh, wow. I love sharing, but your energy really resonates, Matt. And I just wish you nothing but blessings. And mm. I hope your program is an incredible success. I'm telling you, if you're listening, folks, give Matt a call, you know, talk it over, you know, if it's right for you, do it. That's right. Um, and like the same as you, I mean, it, it costs nothing to talk the first time and we have opportunities past that for sure. And if it works for you, that's great. If it doesn't, that's okay. You can move along. At least we can give you something so you don't go leave empty handed. We would never want you to do that. So uh, thank you for that opportunity as well. All right, folks. So hope revealed. Don't forget we have episodes here on Tuesdays. We'd love for you to be a part of that. And uh, now we're, we're really getting to some good traction with our friends and folks over at LinkedIn and super excited to share this uh, program with you all there as well. And uh, Doc Ellen, you are on LinkedIn as well, right? And you do some, Absolutely. you, uh, you have some articles and, and you do some posts on there as well. Or? Tons every day. I usually post three or four times a day i'm starting to put some videos up and uh yeah i'm, I'm i have lots and lots of articles about self-compassion and all kinds of things and i'll oh, tell you people awesome. contact me i'll send you my either my uh my confidence kit or my 10 tips to rock midlife so i'd be happy Ooh. to even if you just want to get those gifts just email me and i can give you links too if you want to put in the bio and be happy to uh give those to people for free Nice. We got freebies on the show today, folks. Freebie, freebie, freebies. Yeah. All right. So thanks for that. We're going to get some stuff to you shortly, folks. If you want to have that, uh, the links will be here for you as well to download that. So again, thank you so much for being here with us today, uh, Ellen. It's been so fantastic. And I'm excited for folks to be able to apply some of the things they've heard today, because uh, when they do that, they're going to find out that they can too say that there has been a hope revealed. Indeed.